projects. Like I know that people are going to jump on, for example, Ma, Ryan Cohen took a picture with uh, next to a bunch of GameStop games just yesterday. And immediately people were like, oh, that means, you know, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. We're going to Valhalla. Uh, that means that the time is up uh, for this game and next that game, right? People don't, uh, people will always give a supply and demand amount of attention to the tweets. For example, Ryan Cohen doesn't tweet very much. So since he tweets so little, every single pixel of a photo that he tweets is important. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I have to plug a few quick things. First of all, my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available to order. You can read some chapter previews by following the link in the description below. Our sponsors, ExpressVPN, get 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN, and get 25% off podcast hosting with Podium. Finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go check out odyssey.com instead. We are hosting all our videos there. If you're a creator, you can move your videos across with one simple click and you can earn cryptocurrency simply by watching videos and use it to tip your favorite creators like myself. So please check that all out if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I have the privilege of talking to Andrew Mo Money. Andrew, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. So uh, as I mentioned before we started there, I am hoping to talk to you about how you got started in investing, in um, how you find GME and AMC, and then uh, a little bit about the community that's kind of built up around this. So why don't you give us an idea of, of how you got into investing in the first place, just to, to give us a good groundwork. I started with the idea that uh, there's this old adage that says time in the market is way better than timing the market. And back, basically the best time to invest is yesterday and the second best is right now. So at that point, I had a little bit saved up. I was going through uh, graduate school. So that believe, that believe it or not, uh, this time in my life, I had no financial education in high school, basically absolutely none in college. And uh, I'm starting to get a little bit teaching myself with Investopedia and just like uh, Reddit and online forums to be able to give me like the technical traders portfolio uh, where I just threw in maybe like a couple thousand dollars. And that was the right time, right? That was the right time because when you are able to buy it, hold it and forget it, uh, you end up actually beating most of these day traders uh, more often than not. Uh, so that gave me the opportunity to start thinking about my career as a person that trades on the side. Right. If your money, uh, so that's uh, the general overview of where I got started. GME was a story that I started picking up from a session with a friend. We were just having a chat and uh, a, a one part of the group had one person that started talking about GME and how overshorting, recursive shorting was a huge issue. So this issue, like I wanted to be able to dive into, I was just like, explain it to me. Like I, I love learning. I love ex uh, having things explained to me. And when I heard that it was as simple to understand as like counting dog food. I wanted to be able to put that on the channel. And so at that point, I already had a YouTube channel for a couple months and the rest is history. That GME video explaining uh, how the short squeeze works with dog food was uh, everything to kick off that passion of mine to explore everything that there is around regulation of uh, market forces and coerced buying when it comes to the AMC and GME saga. Mm. What made you want to start the YouTube channel itself? Like, obviously, you were doing some investing and, and educating yourself, but, but what made you think, okay, I'm going to put this together in a package for the, the general retail investor? Like, What made you want to do that? That's a great question. I think I started with uh, wanting to educate overall. So when I was in high school, I was mentoring middle school kids, right? When I was in college, I was, I was mentoring Chinese adopted kids. Like I always wanted to just have that, uh, that undercurrent of education under my belt. So when the pandemic hit, I started becoming a data science mentor, someone who would try to get you a job in Silicon Valley uh, based on wherever you're coming from. You're a graduate student, you're 30 years in the wrong industry, you're someone who wants to be able to pivot. Um, I was the one that was like, here, this is the job that I think would be best for you and how to prepare for it. 
So from that education, I was wanting to like scale and provide a larger audience with this. And back when I was putting a data science education, you can even go to my YouTube channel and check out the old data science videos. Uh, that was like, maybe if I was lucky, I would get like a couple hundred views. And so at that point it was grinding away for months until I hit a thousand views, sorry, a thousand subscribers. And when I got there, uh, I started growing exponentially when I started talking about uh, the financial and the data side of the GME side. Mm. I mean, people, people like yourself have been uh, incredibly valuable to the community in, in helping to educate people who are just coming to investing stocks, the world of finance. Um, it's been a wild ride of education since January, I have to say. Um, I, I never imagined at the start of this year that I would be um, in the middle of writing, writing a book about some massive financial fraud, because that's just not my area of expertise. But the learning curve has been so steep. Uh, what what have you made just generally of the of the community that's been been built up around this? Because it started with Wall Street bets, obviously it's it's mutated quite heavily since then. But what has been your overall take on on the community that's that's evolved here? They give so much. Shout out right now to Trace Trades. Uh, shout out to Matt Kors. Like these people that build on the foundation of getting you through the door. Right. If you were interested because uh, someone put an article out and maybe it was a family member or a friend into your Facebook inbox or your email and it said GME is going crazy or AMC is going crazy. Like today, hashtag AMC squeeze, I think was trending number two on Twitter, maybe number one now. Uh, it's mainstream, right? People want to know uh, about what's happening with these two stocks. And that gets them their foot in the door of learning more than like a finance degree can get you right? just from these forums alone. So in, in terms of giving, the community not only gives their time, like these people are just all day creating this research because it's not their full-time job, right? They go out and they try to build it on top of what they already know, uh, build it on top of the free time that they have. They could be spending in mean, the pandemic doing, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, but I personally started getting tired of doing X, Y, and Z, right? I really wanted to just be able to start growing something of my own growing not only a platform to be able to explain to people these financial concepts, but also a news like site to be able to catalyze these, uh, these underspoken uh, reports, research, and breaking news. Hmm. It's de that's definitely something that came up quite a lot in the, in the chat I had with um, William Steele, Bill Steele from the, the Stonk News Network. We mm -hmm. talked a lot about how this is, ultimately right now it's an information war and we are doing well against you know the the traditional final or financial institutions because we are able to collaborate all together in producing different little specks of information and there would be no one person who could put together everything that the community has put together as a whole because there's so many tiny different areas of expertise. There's channels doing like different, different analysis of different things. There's people focused specifically on say GME or AMC or um, so there's been people looking at other cryptos that have been involved in like alleged pump and dump schemes by, by hedge funds. There's it's, it's beautiful to watch, man. Yeah. This is uh, essentially what we've wanted to do was pull up this thread of a good opportunity for you. But then what we actually found was that that thread was tied to a sweater that uh, revealed not only is most of our market we had complicated, not only is most of our regulation kick, receiving kickbacks for those criminal activities, but uh, it also ends up being the most unstable financial system like we have as humanity built to date. Mm. Um, and it has been going on for far longer than people thought. Mm. This is a wake up call to more people than just the person that wants to get rich. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a, the, the craziest thing for me is like, I'm in the middle of, of, of a chapter, right in a, a chapter where I'm basically trying to, to figure out how paranoid the community is because we've seen everything 
alleged from hedge funds pumping and dumping different stocks to infiltrating the subreddit to buying off moderators to employing like Cointel Pro levels of of manipulation of the community. Um, there's been like death threats and and there's been like weird messages about like suicide being sent to some of the moderators, and it, it then I came across your video where uh, where you talk about how you had been approached to to shill basically could you give give me a little bit more on or could you give us a little bit more on on what it was like to be approached and what they kind of offered so the end result of that story was how it was a desire of mine to try to like approach this topic without putting on the conspiratorial the paranoia i had right mm. because i because I'm watching the live chat. I'm reading through the forums. Like I know that people are going to jump on. For example, uh, Ryan Cohen took a picture with uh, next to a bunch of GameStop games just yesterday, and immediately people are like, "Oh, that means you know Assassin's Creed Valhalla. We're going to Valhalla. Uh, that means that the time is up uh, for this game and next that game, right? People don't. Uh, people will always give." a supply and demand amount of attention to the tweets. For example, Ryan Cohen doesn't tweet very much. So since he tweets so little, every single pixel of a photo that he tweets is important to his community. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. An eye for detail is not necessarily a bad thing. However, when you actually do get approached by companies that want you to be able to cover other topics using your platform, right? That's something that you have to be able to consider uh, in terms of doing your own research on the company that is approaching you. And then, asking yourself the question of whether or not this serves the community. At the end of the day, uh, I use a lot of the tools on my platform uh, to, the, to the benefit of the community. And when I look at stocks that don't actually resonate with the ethos of the, of the brand and the people that watch the show, then that makes me feel like that is the definition of shilling. And that's something that I wanted to explore. I got, I was able to like finagle the contract out of them. I finagled, finagled how much money they were willing to offer. Uh, and then uh, from that, we were able to basically put a number, a face and a, uh, a method to how people get approached. And if you go and look at some of these articles, you will then, you can look into the embedding of the article itself and see how many people actually got paid. Uh, and they'll tell you the, the amount that's legally obliged that they uh, enclose that this person, this institution got like $25,000. This, inst this influencer with however many followers got $200. This person got $800, et cetera. Mm. What is your thoughts on the extent to which these allegations of people being paid to just post generally on r slash super strong, r slash GME, r slash Wall Street Bets new? What was your thoughts on on how much that was actually happening and how much this is just like a community disagreeing with each other? As in, so I, I want to make sure I answer your question. The, uh, the question is, how much of this is like the community not wanting to see uh, non-GME AMC super stock news versus yeah. how much is this the community thinking that they're actually being attacked? Yeah, essentially. So it, either talking about different stocks, they're then always accused of being distractions. Anyone trying to ask questions or, or who seems to be spreading FUD is then immediately a shill. How much is that, how much is that real? And how much do you think that is the community being paranoid? Uh, shill hunting or witch hunting for shills is very much a real thing, right? The death threats that you mentioned, the, the like, coerced like suicide notes and stuff like that that's mm -hmm. also real mm -hmm. right um i myself have been threatened with like lawsuits for like very you know uh, not defensible things people are like oh yeah we're, we're gonna we're gonna get you we're gonna like find out about this thing and then you kind of are worried about how much you've actually already doxed yourself to a community the community that is this rampant um some of them some of which are uh due to financial reasons right they might be invested heavily in these stocks and they just are worried about one single link of failure. And this is a, that's a fair argument, right? Some of these influencers are just one person. Um, this uh, this 80,000 subscriber YouTube channel that I built, uh, I have to thank immediately my roommate that has helped me edit a bunch of the videos when I was doing data science videos, uh, my girlfriend who uh, constantly helps me do moderating and design work. Uh, by the end of the day, the, the single person that's on the screen 
all day is me. And that gives people that it makes them afraid that when the mother of short squeezes happens, uh, there's going to be a distraction comes up. And if I uh, end up getting distracted, that might hurt the squeeze. I have to say that in my opinion, we have been nonstop trying to tell people that you do your own financial research. If there is a breaking news, I'm going to tell you about it. And then you research it yourself. Some people are too busy to look at the stock market at all times. So they are plug me in while they work standing up all day. And so that they can keep an eye on what news to follow. Right. That's perfectly acceptable uses of this, uh, of this platform so that you can have a bigger scaffolding to do your own financial education. Like, let me cut out the fat for you. Let me cut out the like endless hours of digging through the wrong articles, the, the actual like conspiracy theories. Let me present to you the actual uh, DD that you need to look at. So in the end of the day, to, to circularly answer your question, when people don't want to look at uh, like videos of non-genie related topics, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot stronger hate of that concept than like at a knitting club, you start talking about politics, right? It's definitely similar in the sense that like both of those are kind of like the wrong time to do X, Y, and Z. But when you try to bring a non-GME related topic to a GME subreddit, that's like a cardinal sin. Mm. When you say you were threatened with like legal action, just I assume that was in like a message or something, not not like official. But like, did you notice? Was it in response to something specific that you'd posted? Like, were you able to to pinpoint something that might have triggered that, or do you think it was just the general sentiment you were expressing? Uh, there's three things about that. One, it was like a series of emails. So I've, I'm one, uh, I've been exposed, like I exposed my face. Not every trader does that. So when they, uh, when they come at me, it's, sometimes it's racist uh, remarks. Sometimes it's like, uh, oftentimes it's poorly grammar, but it's like trying to come off as like, oh, we have a class action lawsuit already coming, but I can notice that every other word is spelled incorrectly uh, and there's absolutely nothing of substance in this email. So uh, it ends up, it ends up being like a very difficult like cat and mouse game of taking something seriously versus something else. So in that sense, uh, frivolously trying to attack people uh, that are supporting the cause that you want to support is unfortunately a facet of this community. So like I said, it's incredibly giving, it's incredibly level-minded. The people that follow my channel are now uh, almost to today. We've covered mostly AMC stuff. And uh, there was a comment that said, hey, there was almost nobody calling each other a shill or a distraction. So in that sense, we are starting to become more solidified as a community because we know that when one of these stocks starts to rip, the other one does as well. And we see this uh, for GME holding up AMC's price action, but now today it was reversed. Mm. One of the things I asked uh, Jackson Hunter there during the week when I, when I had him on the show um, go check that out, guys. If you wanna, if you wanna, it's in the description below. I asked, yeah, I asked him about why he thought that AMC and GME had tracked each other so closely over the past four months. Um, and yeah, I was wondering if you had any insights on that. I would say that uh, it's deceptive to try and say that it can be explained away based on like a technical indicator. For example, I've heard a lot of explanations that say it's ETFs, right? They trade in the same ETFs. Um, they, you buy one and then it forces the other one to go up as well. I would say that that's possibly part of the explanation. I would rather try to point it to human behavior, right? GME, uh, SEOs, very similarly to AMC. You search for GME and then you search like GME like stocks, you're immediately gonna get AMC. For people who FOMO'd out of one stock ripping, they're going to then try to divert their attention to another one. So you'll see like minute for minute, candle by candle, that the price action is incredibly similar. And that ends up being a question of, uh, can you actually take the, uh, the technical indicators of a like fickle retail crowd, or can you treat that as part of a larger macro movement? That's the biggest question, right? Is this going to be a squishy rip? Or is a rock solid rate? Mm. Now, one of the things that has been alleged quite a few times over the past month or so is every time uh, Dogecoin goes on some ridiculous run, the accusations are that either it's hedge funds pumping and dumping in order to generate capital 
um, uh, they're attempting to make it look like they've got more assets on their books than there is, or it's uh, a distraction being created to, you know, get the apes away from GME, basically. Um, those are like the three main accusations that get pushed. What are your thoughts on on the idea that, that Doge may have been pushed as a distraction or just as a way for hedge funds to like generate some cash at the moment? I Anything that I say is likely... So one, I'm not invested in Doge. So I want to say that I'm saying trying to speak from like a arbit, arbitrary point of view. Uh, but speaking from that point of view, I haven't done enough like actual research into who holds Doge, even though you could, right? It's the blockchain. You could try to figure out, you know, how many of these wallets end up uh, belonging to a, a BlackRock or another long whale in these uh, cryptos. But what we do know is that the sell-off today, mainly uh, from these cryptos, was from institutions, right? You don't see this kind of behave, uh, retail behavior that can drive this kind of price action down. So that means that we have... Uh, we have these institutions buying into these cryptos. And then when a margin call gets close, they kill the fattest cows first. And the fattest cows of any investment is always going to be the volatile cryptos, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what they're going to be tomorrow. The next one is going to be the, the blue chips, which is the, the opposite reasoning, which is that you know exactly where Apple and Amazon are going to be tomorrow. So they will still be here when if you sell them today. Uh, that's the reason why we see that kind of like triaging of the red when we see a market downturn due to margin calls. That's mm -hmm. been the hot topic. So we want to be able to kind of feed that in there. Cryptos are a tool for everyone. Uh, and the, the end of the day, if you, whether or not you believe in the asset, whether or not you believe in the, the joke nature of Doge, uh, it ends up being a way that you can fuel up for a GNA and AMC rocket. So if you, it's all about intention. If you don't intend to make good on your, um, like if you don't intend to try and take Doge and implement it in the right way for your meme stock, then you are you are a different creature than the person who would be distracted by Doge. Mm. That's a very good point, actually. I guess it's kind of, it's quite a binary way to look at the world. This is like that we're we're all, we're only able to focus our energy on one investment. That's all we're capable of. Exactly. <laughs> mm. So you're basically saying that the the sell-off across the board today on crypto is is the way, the only way it would be possible is institutions offloading massive amounts of liquidity in order to to well theoretically deal with the margin calls that are coming in because retailers don't sell all at once at this exact moment. <laughs> we are we are facing liquidity issues across the board, right? There was a liquidity test today. Uh, that is a simulation of just how badly these institutions are, gonna, are, are going to mess up if these new regulations are going to be put in place. Mm -hmm. So we have governments cracking down. Uh, criminal investigations for these hedge funds are starting to come underway. Like these, uh, as conspiratorial as some parts of these subreddits can be, you know in, in your heart that these institutions are doing criminal activity. Like your, your dad could be doing a mom and pop like uh, tax evasion. Now, like, it, you, can, you can't imagine that a large institution is doing the same, trying to get away as much as they can. They're certainly trying to, but now they're trying to get away with uh, something that millions of, of Americans, millions of, of people across the world don't want them to get away with. And, and that's a different issue than trying to, you know, pay with Venmo or PayPal and, and make a little bit extra off of a, uh, of a cash transaction versus a credit card transaction. Mm. What are your thoughts on on Gary Gensler as as a SEC regulator or head of the SEC? Uh, have you been, you know, is, do you feel positive about the the reforms that he's at least um, sort of making moves towards? Gary the man. Uh, so I have Gary's test of uh, um, what he testified in Congress last week slowly rolling through my mind right now. And the main points he talked about was he mentioned crypto. He mentioned that crypto could have a place in the uh, exchange world very soon because uh, all the uh, DTCC guy could say is T plus one, right? T plus one, like let's get T plus one because at the very least that's um, acquiescing to part of what the market wants, right? They want uh, Robin Hood's liquidity issue to never happen again, right? They're, they're, uh, we don't want to be stopped in the market from 
accessing and buying uh, the stocks that we actually want to at crucial points. So Gary Gensler wants to come in and be the politician. And I think at the end of the day, he one has the experience to make the right choices, but unfortunately two, he has the like uh, cunning of a politician that knows exactly what to say. For example, when we had um, Rashida Tlaib come in and ask him uh, like just the questions about uh, like very closely related to the, uh, what is gonna come next and what is this SEC prepared to do? He was essentially stunned. He, he essentially didn't have a concrete plan ahead of time to prevent something like this from happening again. So I don't remember the details of that specific top of my head, but I remember him like not being able to politician his way out of it. So there's, there's plenty of reason to not trust him, but I think that he, uh, his track record speaks for himself as like someone who can be on our side. So we should accept him, accept him, tell him that we're all watching you. You know, we have the best hopes that you have the best intentions. Do you think that the amount of attention is imp- increasing the likelihood that we get like a fair, like quote unquote, outcome here that the, that the market is essentially allowed to function as it should do you think the amount of attention and eyes on every little move that's happening, like not just in America as well, like there's, it's, it's, it's global. Like GameStop is the most tr- like held stock in, in like, dozens of countries. It's completely insane. Sure, <laughs> like, do you think that that's, that's helpful in uh, to us all really who are, who are just sort of hodling? Do you think that's, <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh... Okay, so the, I, I first thought you said, like, is this helpful for the, the world? And I think like, this, is nece- this is a necessity for the world to be able to finally have complete democratization over this market. Uh, if everyone had a say over what to buy, like, and had the financial education to actually play at the big poker table, right? The, the no limits table, the, big, the table where you can actually subs- like subsist off of and eat from, uh, that would be helpful to millions if not billions of people across the world who have, didn't think that they could. Now, is that helpful to the squeeze? That is a definitive uh, no, because we saw retail traders coming in and then with their naivety uh, in January, uh, selling off and hurting the squeeze the worst way possible, day trading, right? Getting scared, uh, falling for the tricks that hedge funds, the short whales are implementing day to day. And as much as this YouTube channel tries to like show you like this bombshell and this revelation and this explanation, there are still hundreds of videos on my channel that, uh, that you couldn't sit through in a single day. So at the end of the day, it's about availability as much as um, a light bulb memory. It's about uh, presence of this information. So they can just easily stop doing a specific type of attack for a week and apes might just forget uh, we see a, a red day that's not an indication that the fight has been lost mm. i mean my perception of of what is good in a market has been destroyed by this entire saga not that i was particularly well versed in investing before but normally my thoughts were you know investment goes up you should be happy investment goes down oh dear but now <laughs> it goes up i'm like woohoo and then it goes down and i'm like buy the dip <laughs> <laughs> I thought you should think about it. If like if everybody had like a perfectly like accounting brain, and you should think about like the snakes, the snakes and ladders of the world, right? You're not if you're going to buy and then continue buying at advantageous points until you die, and then when you die or you retire, whichever one comes first, uh, you sell, and it didn't really matter, right? Where you bought in. The main point is people need to understand that the roller coaster of the day to day trading is exciting, it makes for good YouTube, but it isn't actually the, the main point of the macro picture, right? You look back at AMC and you think it might have a bad day one day, like uh, one day, and then you back uh, like four days and you see that it's been up 30%, right? That's the same, if you just think about that within one day, AMC barely rose 30% today, it was up 35% then it went back to 24. Because that happened in one day, everybody got insanely hyped about the stock. Well, just think about it in a week. If we could consolidate that price action to just a week's long time, I would take a, a still boring day every other day of the week. Mm. If only we could start thinking about it in like outside of the fourth dimension, outside of the temporal axis. Mm, that's a really good point. 
like the 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 kind of the roller coaster ride of of day trading can be fun but it's also what people are talking about when they say you know you can get sucked in and and watch the markets too much and then lose a lot of money attempting to time things that no one has any idea on whereas exactly. uh, you know the, there there is still something to be said for searching for shout out to roaring kitty deep fucking value uh, <laughs> it's, it's him on my show i can only say uh dfe Mm, yeah, I don't care. I, 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 I'm I from Ireland, so I swear too much anyway. <laughs> so I just decided at the start of, of making this podcast, I was like, look, I'm not going to try and censor myself. Um, it's it, There's no point because it will just, I will, I will not, I will fail one day and then people will get mad. So it's just easier to not. <laughs> um, what is your thought on what the real short interest is on, on GameStop? It's 20%. <laughs> it's uh, take with your fingers and one of these has been shorted. Uh, the reason why uh, is when you take like, for example, Ortex, right? You can go to my channel, you can look at a video, you see the affiliate link of Ortex. Uh, it, ha- it screens 85% of the market and it gives you a better understanding of exactly how many of these shares actually belong to someone else, but they don't know it. And that's the definition of a, sh- of a short, right? A share that belongs to someone else because it's been sold already. Uh, to someone else, uh, but they don't know about that. Uh, the end result of these shorts is that once they uh, once they do something with these shares, right? Either recall them, or they uh, they want to you know sell them, or or uh, they want to do something with that share. Uh, they have to drive the car that's in the garage. It's Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's uh, Lam- uh, Lambo, right? There's a Lambo in this garage. Uh, <laughs> is it yours or is it someone else's? Has it been rehypothecated to oblivion? Like these are the questions that um, will become very apparent once the squeeze closes. So you think it's almost impossible for us to tell at this point? Does the Ortex data include synthetic shares? Because technically, they haven't been lent out to someone else. Uh, if I'm if I'm understanding that correctly. So uh, shorted shares that are synthetic or naked, counterfeit is a better way to say it, uh, hasn't been borrowed from anyone. So it's not part of the figures of borrowable fees for, for GME or for AMC. So in that sense, uh, those are much harder to count. And it's an it's FTD-rooted metric that you could speculate on. Mm. That number has been you know, crazy numbers attached to that, right? We have 91 million for AMC in terms of shorted shares, right? Out of the 400 million shares available, that's around like a 20-ish percent, right? But how many more are naked? Like that's a number that's going to be much more hard and much harder to calculate. Oh, I had totally not thought to ask you about this, but my friend and I were, were very confused last night when we were discussing. So I saw the interest on the, the, the interest to borrow a share of AMC was being reported over 200% interest. Um, and my friend and I were trying to get our head around why like why that that is so high like what does that mean because i thought that it meant that that there was less and less shares able to short and that it was becoming a riskier investment and that's why the the short interest or the the interest on the to to borrow the share was going up but my friend thought the opposite and we couldn't figure out who was right because both seemed like they might be logically true (laughs) I, I can see I can see the confusion. Uh, so if, if you if your friend is right, if I understood that correctly, that supply and demand for borrowing the stock has uh, has skewed towards the demanders, right? The people that want to sh- borrow the stock with the intention to short it have increased their demand, and so whenever uh, shares come off uh, hot and fresh, ready uh, located to be borrowed, they get off the shelves immediately. So think about your local grocer. Right. If everyone's excited for that specific type of Starbucks latte or whatever, uh, that is going to increase the price. And as the price of shorting that stock increases, you know two things. One, someone's maybe many some people are shorting the heck out of the stock, borrowing the stock to do what? It's already over a hundred percent cost to borrow, which means it would be much easier for you to just buy a share in itself. But that's not their intention. Their intention is to short. Uh, and they can't sell a stock unless they either own it, which they don't want to do, because that would be the same as buying a stock from someone, or uh, 
short it by borrowing it from someone and then selling it to someone else. Mm -hmm. So when that number hit 240%, that was an indication that you were willing to pay two and a half times above the actual price of the stock, depending on when you wanted to return it, just to sell it to someone else. So that would mean the price would have to go to around 30% of what it is now in order for that short to then start paying off. Is that right? Is that maths right? Uh, no, actually. Well, it, we can go to the math later, but okay. it depends <laughs> on the, the, the time frame okay. of, the, of how long you want to short it for. But for example, right, it costs like 250% in interest. So mm-hmm. over the course of the time period that that 250%, you could be paying 25 bucks for a $10 share. So in that sense, you have to wait until AMC is worth 25 bucks in order for it to actually uh, be worth it. However, that's not, uh, that's, it's a long position, right? You're, want, you're, you're taking a short position. So you want AMC to go to zero and then you get $10 uh, free because you sold it already at, and you don't have to pay that interest because the stock doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Okay, I got two final questions for you. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not going to ask you to put a figure on it because this is not financial advice. But if you were attempting to try and construct a, an exit strategy or a price floor for AMC, because we have that great website that will do it for GameStop. Like, um, what is the floor? I'll link it in the description. I think it's 17 million now. Um, <laughs> But if you were to try and can advise people on how to how to figure out their own floor or exit strategy on, on AMC, what would you say? I would say think about what would be life-changing money. Start there. Right. <laughs> if you have let's say you have a hundred shares of AMC and you bought it back at let's make the math easy, like 10 bucks. Right. Uh, that's a thousand dollars that you just put in. Well, when AMC goes to a hundred dollars, then you have ten thousand. Is that life-changing money for you? So for some people, like in California, that's barely like two, three months rent. That's not life-changing. Well, then when AMC goes to 1000 then you have um, $100,000. That's still not life-changing to almost uh, most Americans, right? Because it will be able to pay your mortgage off for like a, some, a portion of it. Maybe it will be able to uh, cover your rent for like a couple of years, maybe. But that did, did it really change your life to be able to go abroad for like to Spain for five years. No, you want to have like lasting, life-changing impact on your life. It's different for every single person, right? For someone who is looking to uh, like for, live Lambo forever, you need to be able to understand that eventually you're going to have people in your life that you care about and to support. Some people have those people right now. So it's much easier to make those calculations. Take the money when you feel like you, uh, you have the means to support the person that you love even if that person is you. So we're not, I, we always say scissors in the chat for the paper hands, not out of hatred, but out of the fact that, you know, if you paper hand, the scissors that we're presenting are for you. You're going to hurt our cause for the squeeze, but if you needed it for yourself, that is entirely your prerogative. Nobody's telling you to buy, sell, or hold. This is your risk that you're taking. So we can't, uh, we can't blame you for taking that risk, the same as we can't blame you for absolving yourself of that risk. That was a much more beautiful and philosophical answer than I expected, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of, of like people asking like when exactly, like I, I, right before uh, I finished the live stream, I was asked that like five times in the last like five minutes. So uh, as much as I can, I try to tell people what's a life changing number for you because at the end of the day, like if you care about the infinite squeeze, then just hold until like the price becomes like so high, it's impossible to imagine. Or if you want to just be able to come out with a significant amount of money, then you know what number that is. Just wait until that number. And my own, my other piece of advice is if you're not planning to sell on the way down, which is my strategy, uh, at the very least, sell piecemeal on the way up. Selling all at once is a bad idea for not only you, but everyone involved. Mm. It's a very good, get a good point. I mean, selling all the way down seems like the smarter option, but this is not financial advice. Um, uh, so final question, what do you think is going to be the biggest consequence of this entire saga um, in the next six to 12 months? It's, it's going to cause, luckily in the American government, it's already starting to cause a ripple in criminal investigations, uh, regulatory uh, organizations, as well as the private organizations like DTCC. Right. 
giving out the uh, orders that, hey, it's every shark for themselves. It's shark eat shark. We will literally eat you if you are the one uh, that took too much risk on AMC and GME. They're the ones telling each other that, right? Why would you plan a funeral unless you're expecting someone to die? Why would you have a regulation that says exactly how to uh, like dissolve a hedge fund if you weren't expecting one to, to default? So if you're uh, the most short term, when the squeeze happens, you're going to expect a lot of financial institutions that hold your 401ks, that hold your, uh, your parents' retirement funds to shrivel up. But that's okay if you're the one that becomes a millionaire, right? Good question. Uh, when will hedge funds learn from 2008 financial crisis, from this 2021 financial crisis, that betting on weak assets, betting on uh, poorly shoddy rehabilitation methods, and finally betting against the American, sorry, I'm just saying American, betting against the worldwide hopes of the stocks that we actually care about is a bad bet. Not only for them, as we continuously see how much money uh, Melvin has bled uh, during Q1, but uh, for everybody. So at the very least, I have to say that this saga has a happy ending. Whether or not the, uh, the squeeze is going to be the end of this year, it's going to be next month, whether or not it's in, uh, whether or not it's neither of those possibilities, people are finally waking up to uh, opening up their financial education minds. So channels like yours, channels like mine are the best places to start completely free. Well, that seems like a very nice place on which to end things. Everybody, go check out Andrew's YouTube channel. I will link it in the description below. Uh, comment if you uh, would like to see that book that I'm working on so I can get an idea of how many people are actually interested. And um, keep those diamond hands. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Peace. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War, and most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.